Uh, today, I'm going to have to deal with some authors uh, outside the Dominican and Franciscan orders uh, simply because of the history of this idea of a real distinction between essence and existence, because there were also non-Dominicans and non-Franciscan. Non-Franciscans involved uh, in it, as we shall be seeing. But a number of medieval thinkers found it necessary to posit some kind of distinction in all created beings, including pure spirits such as angels, in order for them to be distinguished from the simplicity of God. The authority of the early medieval thinker Boethius was one influential source for these discussions because in one of his writings, which we know as his De Hebdomadibus, he had proposed a set of axioms several of these which distinguished in some way between that which is, or in quote est, and esse. Thus in Axiom 2 he writes, being and that which is, or in Latin, esse and in quote est, are diverse. And in Axiom 7 he writes, every simple entity has its esse and that which it is as one. And in Axiom 8, he adds, in every composite entity, its essay and that which it is are diverse. I keep using the word essay, which as you all know is the infinitive of the verb to be, because there's some controversy as to, how, uh, as to what it means, and therefore as to how it should be translated. But his understanding of these terms, and especially of essay, was disputed in medieval times, and it continues to be subject to disagreement by some of his interpreters today. The general, although not universal, consensus by contemporary specialists on Boethius today is that he was referring not here to the well-known distinction between essence and existence, in all created beings proposed by Thomas Aquinas, even though some have maintained this. Rather, it's more generally thought that Boethius had in mind a lesser kind of distinction between, we might say, a concrete entity, a being, if you will, on the one hand, signified by that which is, or in quote est, and an abstract form in which the concrete entity shares and which is signified then by the term essay. Another important source for 13th century debates about essence, essence and essay was the Latin translation from Arabic of Avicenna's book entitled First Philosophy or Divine Science. Avicenna opens book five, chapter four, Book one, rather, chapter five of this work by writing, and I quote here in an English translation from the Latin, we will say that thing, and the Latin word there is res, and then being, the Latin word is ends, and the necessary are such that they are impressed on the soul immediately by a first impression that is not derived from other things better known than themselves. And then he likens this to the credulity given to first principles. And then he adds that best suited to be conceived in themselves are notions that are common to all things, such as, and he again cites thing or res, and being or ends, and now he also adds one, unum in Latin. And he adds that the meaning of being and the meaning of thing are conceived in the soul as two meanings, while being and something, in Latin that's aliquid, are different words having one meaning. And then he says, each thing has a proper nature that is its quiddity. And he adds that this quiddity is other than or different from the essay that is synonymous with Latin, uh, pardon me, with aliquid according to the Latin, or according to the translation from the Arabic, other than the existence that corresponds to what is affirmed. 
From these texts, it seems fairly clear that Avicenna defended some kind of distinction between essence or quiddity on the one hand and essay or existence on the other. In a late text in his career, in his commentary on the metaphysics, Thomas Aquinas attributed this theory to Avicenna, but he also criticized him for treating of existence as if it were an accident, and that would be a theory that Aquinas strongly rejected. Some contemporary specialists have suggested that, in, I should say specialists in Arabic philosophy, have suggested that Thomas was misled on this last point because of a faulty translation on the part of the Latin version of Avicenna's metaphysics. Not being an Arabic scholar, I will leave that issue to those who are. But it is important to keep this in mind when we are reading Aquinas on this point. He thought that Avicenna had viewed existence of his, as if it were a superadded accident, and that would be a far cry from Aquinas' own understanding of essay as the intrinsic act of existing, or octus ascendi, of every finite being. But before turning to Thomas's presentation and defense of his own view on the relationship between essence and existence, I would like to note that this issue had already been raised earlier in the 13th century by other Latin writers. Interesting references to it can be found early in the 13th century in the work of a 13th century theologian at the University of Paris, William of Auvergne. He would eventually become the Bishop of Paris and was immediately faced with trying to settle a great strike at the University of Paris, which had been called for six years and which actually lasted two years, from 1229 to 1231. But I won't, <coughs> I won't go into the details of that issue. In his De Trinitate, uh, dated by his editor, Swiltowski, in about 1223, and which appears to be his earliest treatment of this, William assigns a series of names to the first being, the primum essay, by which he means God, and he notes that he is most truly essay and essential essay, and that for him essay and that which is, and likewise that which is any of the subsequent names of essay then that he offers are one and the same. And shortly thereafter then he turns to what he calls possible being, ens possibile, meaning thereby potential being, but also meaning thereby, thereby a contingent being. And he writes that it is not ens parasensium, it's not a being by its essence, and comments that it and its essay are truly two, duo sunt, he says. So he's saying now that they are distinct in some way. He adds that one happens to the other and is not included in its nature or quiddity. So he means that uh, essay happens then to the essence and is not included in its nature or quiddity. And he also adds that being and ends when realized in this way is composed and it can be resolved into its possibility or quiddity on the one hand and its essay on the other. Now from these texts, one would strongly suspect that William has defended a real distinction between essence and existence. But this claim has been disputed by some modern interpreters in light of a remark William makes in a later work entitled On the Universe, or De Universo, in chapter three. There William refers to the essay of every caused being as separable from such a being, at least by the intellect, thereby perhaps suggesting that he may then have had some doubts about there being a real distinction 
between essence and existence in created things. Nonetheless, in a still later remark in that very same book, he asserts this distinction between them without any reservation or hesitation. So I'm inclined to take this as his final thought on this topic, along with a conclusion which has been reached by a scholar named Kevin Castor, even though this had been denied by Gilson and then doubted by Armand Maurer. With this, we then can turn to a, a truly universal philosopher and theologian, the Dominican, Dominican Albert the Great. And his dates are roughly 1200 to 1280. The date of his birth is uncertain, but circa 1200 seems to be the best estimate for this. Well known, of course, as a teacher of the youthful Thomas Aquinas, probably already during Thomas's first sojourn in Paris, and certainly then during the period from 1248 until 1252, when both Thomas and Albert were in Cologne. Albert was, of course, a prodigious writer and scholar throughout his long career. He was well known also for commentaries on Aristotle's writings that he produced along with many, many in more independent works. His views on the relationship between essence and essay are not all that clear, however, and the proper interpretation of them has been disputed by the different modern scholars who have attempted to sort them out and make them consistent with one another. This is in part, I think, because at different places in his corpus, he correlates them in different terminology. And so it has been quite difficult for modern scholars to reconcile all of them. At the risk of oversimplifying his views, underlying Albert's various presentations is the Boethian distinction between that which is and essay, or in quote us, and essay. Albert understands this as a distinction between a concrete subject, or suppositum, he sometimes names it, signified as that which is, or by that which is, is and essay, sometimes also expressed as that by which something is, id quo est, rather, in that case, rather, id quo est rather than id quo est, and signifying the form or the nature that exists in the composite. For Albert, then, this would be the form of the whole rather than the substantial form, which might be called the form of the part, that informs matter in the case of material entities. And according to Albert, this kind of composition is found in spiritual entities without there being any kind of matter in them. So he <coughs> would reject then what came to be known as universal hylomorphism universal matter form composition. And so, when used in this way, essay is really signifies the essence or nature that is realized in a concrete subject, and not its active existing as, as that will be developed by Thomas Aquinas. So their, their two uh, positions do differ. Thus, for instance, in an early writing on De Quat work on Equates, he writes as follows, and I quote, Quo est is the form of the whole, but quod est names the whole itself of which the former is simply a part. And this composition exists in things that are incorruptible and not subject to generation in which the form of the whole does not differ from the form of matter, since such a thing has no matter. He explains that this is true in spiritual substances, then, in which there is no matter and no composition, except that between the supposit or subject and then the nature which is realized in the supposit. 
And so here he is defending a distinction between a concrete individual subject signified by quote est and its nature or form which is signified by esse. And this therefore reminds us of, let's say, the, the one interpretation of the original distinction proposed by Boethius between that which is and esse, as I've mentioned above. But on other occasions, instead of using essay to signify the essay or form of a subsisting subject, Albert also at times uses it to signify existence, taken as that by which things simply are, rather than to signify that they are what they are. And uh, a young scholar named Rosa Vargas points out this usage that it's owing to the influence on him of Avicenna. She's written a very interesting article on this general topic in Albert uh, in a companion to Albert the Great. And uh, that's a huge volume, actually. And Dr. Noon has a contribution in it since he's going to be speaking. So I would also give him a nod of appreciation. But I recommend the volume. And, uh, but. Uh, it is uh, very, very large, so large I'm afraid the binding might break, but in any event, <laughs> but it's well worth the using. And uh, uh, she also notes that Albert in another text taken from his commentary on first sentences at Distinction 8, Article 5, Albert holds that essay, properly speaking, belongs to God alone whereas created essay depends upon an extrinsic cause to be realized, and therefore it is contingent. And he says it can be described as an accident, improperly speaking, since, as Albert also puts it, it happens to that which is. Just as a footnote and aside, uh, Cedar of Brabant, uh, who that's not a household name, I realize, but uh, he's often referred to as uh, one of the leading Latin Averroists in the Faculty of Arts. Actually, uh, during Thomas's time, also at the University of Paris, and he discusses this issue of distinction between essence and essay uh, in his questions on the metaphysics, of which there are four versions. But in any event, uh, he does talk about Albert and Avicenna as having treated essay as if it were an accident. And Caesar rejects that very strongly. In fact, uh, he rejects the real distinction between essence and existence, at least at that point in his career. Although after uh, 1270 and the events that happened then, uh, he wrote another work which was lost until about 1967 and then has been edited. It's a set of questions on the Liber de Causes. And there, quite surprisingly, he writes as though he was accepting some kind of distinction between essence and essay. He had in the earlier case, after having mentioned Albert and uh, Avicenna by name, also referred to Brother Thomas, saying he agreed with him, but he couldn't understand his formulation of it. And then he quotes a difficult text uh, from Thomas's commentary on the metaphysics, um, the end of footnote. But in any event, then, to return to Albert here, um, uh, when he says that, for instance, essay can ha happen improperly speaking, it can be described as an accident improperly speaking, it happens to the essence. Um, I think uh, he's not simply calling it an accident. He says it's improper, improper speech, if you will. Okay, in any event then, um, going further, uh, Albert does appeal then to his distinction between in quotas and essay, taken as a distinction between a suppositor concrete subject on the one hand and a universal former nature on the other to distinguish created spirits such as angels from the perfect simplicity of God. And therefore also then 
to justify his rejection of matter form composition of, of such entities. Now, this leads Vegas to introduce a further distinction Albert makes between essay taken as an act of essence, octus essentiae, and even then, sometimes more rarely, as octus essendi. Not taken as octus essentiae, therefore, essay really is signifying the essence of a finite being, if you will, of an individual being, considered not in the abstract, but rather as perfecting an individual uh, id quod est, in other words, an individual subject. So again, in this usage then, uh, essay is being called as the act of essence, and it's again being set on the side of essence rather than on the side of existence as Aquinas would understand it. And uh, finally, he also at times, as I mentioned, <coughs> uses the terminology of octus ascendi. I think this one's more difficult to fit into the others. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Vargas makes a good case, a good effort, I would say, and says that essay then could be described as the first form, as it were, in, shall we say, the essayness of an existing quote est. And so we should say that the act of existing is a formal part of the essence of existing substances. So even that usage then, she argues, then falls on the side of essence. And I think that's probably as good as one can do in reconciling those different usages. There were several other earlier efforts in the 20th century to bring them together, but none of them that I've seen, and I'm familiar with about four of them, including a book in German by Georg Wieland, uh, was able, though, to bring all four together. They had to accuse uh, Albert of inconsistency or some inconsistency. Albert's understanding of essay, therefore, though, should not be identified with Thomas's view of it as an ontologically real constituent of every finite being that is really distinct from the being's essence. So the similarity in the two thinkers' language, for instance, especially after Sesendi, uh, does not point to a similarity in, or identity in, doc in doctrine. With this, I'd like to turn now to uh, the Franciscan St. Bonaventure as one of the outstanding Franciscan thinkers of his day. And in his case, the defense of divine simplicity requires some kind of composition in all creatures of matter and form. So this is a theory of universal hylomorphism, meaning everything other than God is composed of matter and form. Certain medieval Christian thinkers uh, traced this theory back to St. Augustine, but others rejected that claim, such as Albert and Thomas Aquinas, they rather traced it back to Ibn Gabiril, or in Latin, Avicebron, who was a Spanish Jewish philosopher who wrote in Arabic and who lived in the 11th century and wrote a book entitled Fons Vitae, or Source of Life. This book was translated from Arabic into Latin in the 12th century. And in his commentary on the sentences in Book 2, Distinction 3, Part 1, while discussing angels, Bonaventure raises three questions concerning their essences or natures. First, he asks, is an angel simple or is it composed of matter and form? Second, he asks, if it is composed of matter and form, is the matter of spirits essentially the same as the matter of corporeal beings? And third, he asks, if this is the case, is this matter numerically the same? Of greatest interest to us is Bonaventure's discussion of the first question. I'll repeat that question. Is an angel simple or composed of matter and form? 
Here, he, Bob Aventure offers four opening arguments in favor of matter form composition of angels, and then four arguments opposed to this. In the corpus, he maintains that it must be held as certain that the essence of an angel is not completely devoid of composition. Since it is certain that such a being is composed in different ways. He says, first, as related to its cause, since it depends on that cause or God, who is most simple and absolute, and therefore it must fall into some kind of composition. Second, the cause-effect relationship of an angel, he says, may be viewed in the opposite direction. That is, we can think then of an angel as a cause or principle of certain effects. And viewed from this standpoint, the angel must be composed of substance or an operative power, which is to say of substance and accident. Third, an angel may be viewed as falling into a genus, and therefore, according to the metaphysician, is composed of act and potency, but according to the logician, is composed of genus and difference. And finally, fourth, an angel may be viewed as an, an end in itself, and thus, as regards its essay, is composed of ends in essay, meaning by essay, essence again. As regards its essential existence, also signified by essay, there's a composition of quodest and quoest. So this is harking back to the Boethian distinction. And third, as regards its individual or personal existence, there's a composition of quodest and who it is, quisest, if you will. Now, Bonaventure does not deny that these compositions are present in an angel, but he thinks they're not enough. They are not sufficient to account for the non-simplicity of angels and pro protect, as it were, the perfect simplicity of God. And therefore, he concludes that such beings must be composed of matter and form. And while there is a certain similarity between Bonaventure's view and that of Albert, nonetheless, his claim that angels are composed of matter and forms sharply distinguishes his position from that of Albert. So here they are very different from one another. In support, he argues, or rather he recalls from some of his opening arguments that mutability must be present in angels not only with respect to their ability to exist or not to exist, but also with respect to other properties. And this implies a capacity for them to be acted upon by something else. He calls it passabilitas. As well as a certain ground for individuation and limitation, all of which requires a fundamental composition within the nature of the angel. And so he sees no reason to deny that an angel is composed of diverse natures, and he argues that these are matter and form, and they must be related as the potential or the possibilis and the actual. And he says he thinks that this position is truer than any other that has been offered. In responding to the second general question he'd raised at the beginning of his discussion concerning whether the matter of spiritual and corporeal things is the same essentially, Bonaventure attempts to harmonize different answers offered to this question by the practitioners of different sciences. That is to say, he singles out the natural philosopher who studies corporeal things here on earth. He refers to the natural philosopher as physicus inferior. And uh, you can figure out what that means, even if you don't know Latin. So <laughs> just reverse the words. And, uh, so uh, that would be the inferior. But he goes on to say that uh, the universal, this is the natural philosophy who studies things here on earth. 
Then he speaks of a universal physicist who studies heavenly bodies insofar as they are subject to locomotion. And then finally, the metaphysician. And so he says then that the lower natural philosopher studies things insofar as they are subject to generation and corruption. And he reduces these to matter insofar matter is a principle of such change. But now, this kind of change is restricted to terrestrial bodies. In other words, Bonaventure accepts the then generally accepted theory that the heavenly bodies were incorruptible. But then he goes on to suggest that the universal physicist <coughs> studies matter as changeable with respect to form and to position and finds the same potentiality in lower and in higher bodies for change in position, and therefore concludes that the matter of all bodies is one and the same. And the metaphysician studies the nature of every creature, especially every substance, or ends per se, in terms of its active being, octus ascendi, which its form gives along with its ability to exist per se, given by that in which the form inheres, that is to say, by matter. Given this, the metaphysician asserts the oneness of matter in all created beings, per se, or all substances, with the exception, of course, of God. And Bonaventure concludes that because the metaphysician judges in a more excellent way, those who defend the same matter in corporeal and spiritual beings uh, have the better argument. He says they speak better, actually. I would note also in passing that many years later in Bonaventure's uh, Collationes in Hexameron of 1273, in Vision 1, Conference 1, he returns briefly to this issue. He lists there a series of divisions that assist one in arriving at a knowledge of things. The fifth is the division between the simple and the composite. And there he rejects the view of some that an angel is simple. He argues that if it were true that an angel was a form without any matter, then it could be subject to no accidents. And he cites a text from Boethius's De Trinitate, which is another one of the uh, theological tractates by Boethius, to this effect that forms are not the subjects of accidents. Albert notes that in Book I of the Physics, Aristotle writes that matter together with form is the cause of accidents. So Bonaventure maintains that it's imprudent to say that an angel is simple for then one might seem to attribute to an angel something that is unique to God. So in other words, Bonaventure continued to require matter form composition of all creatures to protect the divine simplicity. Now with this background in mind, we can turn now to another Dominican, namely Thomas Aquinas himself and his defense of a real distinction between essence and essay taken as the octus ascendi. It's interesting to find this doctrine in one of his earliest writings, his little treatise, De Ente Ad Essential, and I'm sure many of you have read it, which dates from his time when he was the Bachelor of Sentences in the Theology Faculty at the University of Paris. This small treatise seems to have been written at the request of a fellow Dominican student, or perhaps students, and would date then from that period from 1252 to 1256. In chapter four of the De Ente, Thomas writes that at this point, he must determine how essence is realized in separate substances. And he names three, the human soul, intelligences, and the first cause, or God. He acknowledges that while everyone would grant the simplicity of the first cause, some would introduce matter form composition into human intelligences, uh, pardon me, into intelligences and into the human soul. 
and he identifies Avicebron as the likely author of this view in his Fons Vitae. Thomas immediately notes that this view is contrary to the position held by philosophers generally, who view separate substances as free from matter, and argue for this point based on the presence of the power of understanding within them. He concludes there can be no matter form composition either of human souls or of intelligences, of course, or of Christian angels. He cites from the Liber de Causis, Proposition 9, to this effect that an intelligence has form and essay. And he takes the term form here as signifying a simple quiddity or nature or essence. He also points out that the essence of a composite substance differs from the essence of a simple substance in that the essence of the composite includes matter, while the essence of the simple substance does not. On this point, I might note that he's following Avicenna and rejecting the view of Averroes about this in Averroes' long commentary on the metaphysics. There was a dispute uh, as to whether or not for the essence of a simple substance or the quiddity of a simple substance includes matter as well as form. And uh, Thomas Aquinas, as you probably know, actually uh, read Aristotle as uh, saying yes to that question. I think most Aristotelian scholars today would say uh, no, that Aristotle said no to that question, that really it's the form that is identical with the quiddity or the essence. Uh, I think that may be another example of what Terrell has called on Thomas's part of um, reverential interpretation of past authorities. And the medievals, medievals, Thomas included, did a great deal of that. But in any event, to return now to his argument in the De Ente, he argues then to the threat to divine simplicity that might seem to result from his rejection of matter form composition of intelligences or angels and he does this by introducing, at least as I interpret it, a three-stage argument to prove that intelligences, along with all other created beings, are composed of two distinct ontological principles, an essence and an active existing essay, which are united in such beings as potency and act. Now, I... <clears throat> I would emphasize this because his argument will not be completed until he establishes that final point, the potency act composition then of such beings. Stage one reads this way, whatever is not included in the understanding, the intellect is of an essence or quiddity, comes to it from without and enters into composition with it. Because no essence can be understood without those things which are part of its essence. Then, but the minor, but every essence or quiddity can be understood without anything being understood about its essay, about its existence. Then the proof he offers is this, for I can understand what a human being is or what a phoenix is and yet not know whether it exists in reality. Therefore, the conclusion is, it is evident that essay is other than quiddity. Now, this is the end of stage one. If this is argument viewed as a complete argument in itself, as it often has been, it's often been taken out of the context and separated from the rest of the argument, and if one does that, I think then very serious objections can be raised against it. It seems to rest on a distinction between what is grasped by the intellect's first operation, that would be its essence or quiddity, and that what is grasped by a judgment indicating that such an essence actually exists. But this does not of itself seem to require positing a corresponding real distinction within such an entity between two distinct ontological principles, an essence and an active existing 
at best, it seems to point only to a logical distinction or a conceptual distinction. Moreover, as uh, <clears throat> my old professor from many years ago at Louvain, uh, Fernand Van Stiebergen, pointed out, it seems to use essay in two different ways. That is, first to signify the fact that given, a given essence exists, and second, in the conclusion, to signify an intrinsic and really distinct principle of being. Those are two very different usages of essay, which Thomas himself distinguishes clearly in other contexts. So I think that's also a rather difficult to account for. And finally, it has not shown that these two principles are related to one another as act in potency, which Thomas has indicated is the ultimate goal of his argument. So the weakness of presentations by those followers of Aquinas who offer this as a complete argument, I think, has been pointed out by contemporary scholars and it was already recognized by critics in medieval times. So as some of you know at least, I've long argued that it should not be presented as the complete argument for a real distinction between essence and existing, but only as an opening stage in a three-stage argument. So stage two, here Thomas introduces what I regard as the second stage of the argument, and indeed as the core of the whole argument, even though it's been overlooked and misinterpreted by many Thomistic scholars. When he writes, unless perhaps there is something whose quiddity is its essay, so I would emphasize that he's not assuming that God exists. He's simply saying, unless perhaps, forte is the Latin term he uses there. And so unless perhaps there is a being, his quiddity is its essay itself. Rather, instead of assuming it actually exists, he argues there could at most be only one such being. And in order to make this point, he adds that it's not possible for something to be multiplied except in one of three ways. First, by the addition of a difference, as a generic nature is multiplied in species. Or second, in the way of a form is received in different instances of matter. Or third, by its being absolute, that is to say, unreceived in one case and in all other cases received in some subject. As if supposed, if there were, even though this is not the case, a certain heat that existed apart from any receiving subject, any heated thing, by reason of its being separate, it would be distinct from any instances of heat that was not separate but received in a subject. So now he reasons, but if there were something that was pure essay, so as to be subsisting essay, it could not be multiplied in the first way by adding a specific difference. For then Thomas counters it would not be pure essay, but essay plus the differentiating form. Nor, he continues, could it be multiplied in the second way by being received in different instances of matter, for it then would be essay plus matter. And so he continues by process of elimination, then there can only be one instance of a being that is subsisting essay itself, and concludes from this that it's necessary that in every other thing, apart from that one possible exception, its essay and its quiddity or its essay and its essence must be as different other, he says, which is to say they must be distinct from one another. And now he there applies it to the case of intelligences. Therefore, in intelligence, he argues, there must be essay in addition to their form. And he recalls his earlier citation from the Liber de Causes, that an intelligence is form and essay. Thomas then uses that conclusion to introduce a brief but metaphysical argument for the existence of God, 
and this will enable him to correlate essence and the act of existing as potency of act in all other things. This stage begins with his observation that whatever pertains to something is either caused from the principles of its own nature, as is true of a human being's ability to laugh. In other words, he thinks that a common, a part of me, a sense of humor is as a necessary property of a human being. You may doubt that, but in any event, <laughs> um, Thomas often uses this as, as an example of a property, a proper accident, if you will. So he's saying then here, whatever pertains to something is either caused from the principles of its own nature or comes to it from some extrinsic principle. But he argues that essay, meaning the act of existing, cannot be efficiently caused by the former nature of a thing. For then such a thing would be the efficient cause of its own existence and bring itself into existence, which Thomas rejects as impossible. And uh, basically because he thinks such a thing would have to both exist insofar as it communicates existence and not exist insofar as it receives it at one and the same time. So he goes on then to argue that everything whose essay is distinct from its nature receives its essay from something else. In other words, every such being is efficiently caused. So this is actually his way here of arguing for, let's say, the principle of causality. So he goes on to suggest, and because that which exists through another is traced back to that which is of itself as its first cause, then there must be something that is the cause of existing, the causa ascendi, for all other things. Otherwise, he said, we would regress to infinity of cause causes of existence. And so an intelligence includes both form and an act of existing, and receives its existence from the first cause or God. But what receives something from something else, he reasons, is in potency with respect to what it receives, and what is received is its act. Hence, an intelligence is in potency with respect to the essay it receives from God, and its essay is received as its act. And thus, potency and act are found in intelligences. And this was to be the conclusion of his argument. And he remarks <clears throat> that some say intelligences, therefore, are composed of quotas and essay, as Boethius had described it. Now, Thomas offers other arguments for the distinction between essence and essay, and limitations of time won't per won't permit uh, will not permit me to delay over those. In my book to which Father Legge referred in introducing me, I did single out five major ways in which I find him arguing for this conclusion. Let it suffice here for me to note that a number of them use the reasoning that we've seen in stage two of the Deyente. So Thomas never abandoned that way of arguing for the real distinction. In addition into the argument, therefore, from the day end day, I have singled out number two, arguments based on the impossibility of more than one being in which essence and essay are identical. And then number three is a genus argument, I'm calling it, according to which membership in a, de in a genus requires any such substance to be composed of essence and existence. Number four would be arguments based on participation, and number five, arguments based on the limited character of individual beings, and also on Aquinas' this view that unreceived act is unlimited. That's a necessary part of that argument, if you will. I should also mention that as time went on in his career, Thomas developed his metaphysics of participation much more fully. Equally important for his metaphysics of essay existence was his development of a new understanding of essay as a principle of perfection, as the Octus Ascendi, 
so much so that by the time of his de potentia, he would refer to it as the act of all acts and the perfection of all perfections. That famous quotation is in question seven, article nine, reply to the second objection. This would also serve to strengthen his case for the real distinction between essence and essay. It's important also to remember that he distinguishes using the verb essay to signify the fact that something exists on the one hand and to signify the act of all acts and the perfection of all perfections on the other hand. And that seems to be an absolutely original uh, position developed by Thomas Aquinas. Fabro thinks that he was inspired in part by the Liber de Causis, in part by Pseudodenis or Dionysius, and, uh, <clears throat> and then in part also by Aristotle's uh, theory of act and potency, but then brought these all together and gave them an entirely new uh, application. But I think it's important to stress how much, um, how important he regards that notion that essay signifies the octus essendi. As Fabro also pointed out in his <clears throat> very important first book on participation in Aquinas, the fact that something exists is, as Fabro puts it, the result of the presence of the active existing within the being. So I, I would call your attention to that. I think that is a major uh, part of Aquinas' metaphysics, largely ignored by many North American Thomistic scholars in the 20th century, sad to say, probably because they didn't read Italian. <laughs> Faber wrote primarily in Italian, but occasionally in French. And uh, now, uh, the press called ADV is putting Fabro's works out again, uh, republishing the Italian versions, and they've done some translating into other languages, but they have not yet translated uh, either of the great books on participation that he wrote into English. I hope they will because uh, he was really a very important uh, Thomistic scholar in the 20th century and has been largely overlooked in North America. Now, if this from Thomas to Scotus uh, was the, the, the limits that I wanted to cover in this paper, so I have to fill in a little bit between the two. We, I've said enough about Thomas, but uh, between them we have now uh, Giles of Rome, Henry of Ghent, and Godfrey of Fontaine are the major players in this debate. First Giles of Rome, or Aegidius Romanus, is the Latin for him. <clears throat> Shortly after the death of Thomas Aquinas, March 7, 1274, there is evidence of a controversy developing within the theology faculty at the University of Paris about this very issue, the distinction between essence and essay. So in his Quadlibet I of 1276, a member of that theology faculty, Henry of Ghent, was very critical of a theory of real distinction between essence and existence as it was then being proposed, presumably by somebody within the theology faculty. Henry's account of the theory of real distinction that he was opposing refers repeatedly to essay as a thing, a res. And this is far removed from the thought of Aquinas. He would have been horrified at that because for, this would be, the rest for him is convertible with ends. And uh, so um, this is simply, it misses the whole point of Aquinas' distinction between essence and essay. On the other hand, this terminology was used by Giles of Rome a young member of the Augustinian order who was then studying and lecturing on the sentences at Paris. Adaborations of Giles' theory are already present in his commentary on books one and two of the sentences, and these go back <clears throat> to the early 1270s, and then in his slightly later Theoremata de Corpore Christi of 1274. 
In the latter work, he mentions that there he had not fully presented his understanding of the relationship between essence and existence, and had not yet determined whether essentia and esse can be called two things, due res, and whether esse flows from essence and is its act. But he promised that he would take that up elsewhere. And so he did. He developed this position very fully in his Theoremata de Esse et Essentia, sometime in the period between 1278 and 1285, when he, in fact, was in exile from the theology faculty. And in his disputed questions on Esse and Essentia, Questionis Disputate de Esse et Essentia, from 1285 to 1287, he developed it even more because he was responding to criticisms which had been raised again by Henry. Now I should note also that owing to a number of positions on philosophical and theological matters Giles had taken when he was commenting on the sentences of Peter the Lombard in the early 1270s, he had been censured by the theology faculty at Paris in 1277 and asked to, redirect, to reject, or at least correct, 51 propositions taken from his commentary on first sentences. He refused to do this, and so he was prevented from incepting as a magister, as a master, and was barred from the theology faculty from 1277 until he was finally readmitted in 1285 owing to an intervention by the Pope. Given this, I think it likely, very likely, that it was Giles against whom Henry was already arguing in his Quadribut I of question 10, for instance, of 1276. Also, unlike Thomas, Henry also begins to speak of essence and essay as essay essentiae and essay existentiae. And this terminology often reappears in subsequent discussions of the relationship between essence and existence. Even though such terminology does not appear in Thomas and does not capture his understanding of essence and essay and threatens to turn the act of existing into some kind of quiddity or essence. So that's a very bad choice. When you see someone using that language, then whether they know it or not, they're really responding to Giles of Rome rather than to Aquinas. But that language caught on, and you'll find it being used by Godfrey, by Henry, and by Giles at time as well. So unlike Thomas, Henry then begins to speak of essence and essay as essay essentiae and essay existentiae. And uh, as I say, I think that had a rather bad effect as far as Thomas's own theory was concerned and knowledge of it. But to return to Giles' mature discussions of this issue in his Theorema de Deesse et Essentia, in Theorem 5, he reasons, just as generation makes us know that matter differs from form, so creation makes us understand that essence differs from essay. And again, just as form is a certain actuality and perfection of matter, so existence is a certain actuality and perfection of essence. And just as matter really differs from form, so essence really differs from essay. And just as form is impressed on matter by a generating agent, so existence is impressed on essence by God, the creating agent. So he's drawing out a rather sharp parallel there between generation resulting in matter and form and creation resulting in essence and essay. And critics like Henry would reject that analogy rather strongly. But he builds another argument on the fact that a created nature can exist or not exist, therefore it's in potency to existence. And since potency is really distinct from act, essence that receives existence is as distinct from its existence as potency is from act. 
And then in the spirited questions 9 and 11, as I've already mentioned, they just a little later than the theorematon. <clears throat> Zhao's response to Henry's critique of his theory in, in Henry's Quadrivid One. He repeats some arguments Henry had offered in support of a real distinction between essence and existence as opening objections against his own rejection of them and his critique of any real distinction between them. And then he offers other arguments, especially one based on his understanding of participation. In Thames, which remind me of Aquinas' discussion of participation in his commentary on the De Hebdomadibus in Lexio II, Giles remarks that the term participate derives from the Latin partem capere, or to take a part of something rather than to possess it wholly. And Thomas had made the very same point in, in that uh, text. Thus, that which participates in a perfection or act does not possess it in its fullness or totality. So to, to account for the limited presence of the perfection in the participant, one must postulate <clears throat> that it is received by a distinct limiting and potential principle. This is Giles' argument. And therefore, in finite or limited beings, one must account for the limited character of any such being by postulating an essence that receives and limits its existence. And one must hold that essence and its active existence are really distinct from one another. Giles offers another argument that reminds us of stage one of Aquinas' argumentation in the De Ente but it goes a step further. The Thomas had said, I can know what something is without knowing that it is. And Giles repeats this, but he adds to Aquinas' argument, I can even know what something is and know that it does not exist. But non-existence and existence are opposed to one another, Giles continues. Therefore, since essence can be understood as not existing, Essence and existence must differ and really differ. This is in disputed question 11. Troubling, however, as I've already anticipated to some extent, for anyone who would view Giles as a father of Aquinas on the nature of this distinction between essence and existence is Giles' repeated reference to the distinction between them as a distinction between two things. He says, do a res. In addition to references I've already mentioned, in Theorem 19 of the Theoremata, Giles writes that he's already shown in Theorems 5 and 12, and I quote in my English translation, that existence and essence are two things, do a res. As I've said, this is certainly not Aquinas' view, and it's an unfortunate choice by Giles. <coughs> Even if he is perhaps presenting this not as Thomas's view, as has often been assumed, but rather as his own point of view. The weakness of this language is that if every finite being is composed of an essence thing and an existence thing, or res, then one can use the same logic to conclude that the essence thing and the existence thing must themselves be composed of two other essence things and existence things, and so on ad infinitum. So, uh, and in fact, that kind of argument, our type of argumentation was used against Child, both by Henry in Quadribut 1, <coughs> question 9, and in by Godfrey in Quadribut 3, question 1. With this, I turn to Henry of Ghent, who is another secular master, but enough has already been said to make it clear that Henry rejected any kind of a real distinction between essence and existence. Well, his immediate target in Quadribut 1 of 1276 seems to have been Giles, as I've indicated. There can be no doubt about this in his Quadribut 10 of 1286. After Giles had returned to the theology faculty at Paris and was functioning now as a master, as a magister. Having rejected Giles' arguments for a real distinction between essence and existence, 
Henry then offers his own solution. On the one hand, he argues it cannot be said without some qualification that the essence of any creature is pure and subsisting essay. Henry wants to preserve that kind of language for God alone. On the other hand, he says it cannot be denied without some qualification that the creature is its essay, since Henry claims to have demonstrated that a creature is not really distinct from its essay. And so Henry distinguishes between essay essentiae, which applies to it insofar as it depends upon God as its exemplar cause, and it applies to essay actualis existentiae. That applies to it only insofar as it depends upon God as its efficient cause. If taken in the first sense as essay essentiae, Henry says we can admit that the creature is identical with its essay, since this differs from it only conceptually. But if taken in the second way, in the sense of essay existentiae, the essay of existence, Henry maintains that it is not merely conceptually or logically distinct from its essence, but it's also by means of an intermediate distinction, which Henry has invented and calls an intentional distinction. And thus one cannot say that a being is its essay existentiae, even though they are not really distinct. <coughs> To help explain what he means by his intentional distinction, he illustrates by appealing to the kind of distinction that applies to a genus and a difference, such as animal and rational. This, he claims, is more than a pure distinction of reason, but less than a real distinction. Hence, he calls it an intentional distinction. Suffice it to say that neither Giles nor Godfrey of Fontaine was satisfied with Henry's explanation, nor did either of them see any need for this intermediate intentional distinction that he had invented. With this, I turn then to Godfrey of Fontaine, who was a secular master of theology at Paris from 1285 to 1303 to 1304. In his Quadribut II of Easter 1286, Godfrey notes that one might hold that existence is the act of essence and therefore a thing, a res, that is really distinct from essence. So he's there obviously referring to Giles. And or, Godfrey continues, one might hold that us and existence are really identical and differ only conceptually. In fact, that's going to be Godfrey's position. Or one might hold that they differ intentionally, and that, of course, was Henry of Ghent's position. Now, in <coughs> raising, in this quadrivit too, Godfrey does not offer a decisive answer of, of concerning his own position. But he simply judges it more probable that existence, I say existentia, and he uses that terminology, is not a distinct thing, not distinct from essence. So again, immediate, as far as geography is concerned, is the language of Giles of Rome. But in his Quadrivit three question one, Godfrey presents at length Giles' theory of a real distinction between essence and essay and sharply criticizes it, along with a briefer critique of Henry's intentional distinction between them. Among his arguments against a real distinction is one that Godfrey connects with Aristotle's Metaphysics 4, Chapter 2, and with the Verowee's commentary on this, to the effect that being involves less addition than does unity or oneness to that of which it is affirmed. Since oneness adds nothing real to essence, the argument is neither does being or ends, and therefore <coughs> neither does essay. Moreover, unless one grants that each thing is a being by reason of itself and not by reason of some superadded essay, one would have to account for the being of this superadded fact, and so on again to infinity. In his defense of real identity between essence and existence, 
God, that Godfrey argues that a concrete noun, an abstract noun, and a verb do not signify really distinct things. They differ only in their modus significandi, their mode of signifying. If this is true, for instance, of the Latin currens, meaning a runner, and then cursus, meaning race, and then currere, meaning um, currens, but running, so it is true of ends of being, essentia, essence, and esse, which is to exist. Godfrey makes the same point many years later in Quadlibet 13, question 3 of 1297 and 1298. So he considers and rejects the argument that unless there is a real distinction between essence and existence, the existence of created entities would not be participated and therefore they would be as simple as God. He responds that the essence of a created being is participated and more composite than the divine essence, not by including diverse things, diverse res, but by the reason of one and the same thing that is potential when compared to a more perfect being and actual considered in itself. And in Quadlibet 7, he explains that if angels do not fall into a natural genus, they do fall into a logical genus. Since again, he says, any one of them can be viewed as potential when compared with a higher being and as actual when compared to a less perfect being. And in support of this, he cites Proposition 2 from Proclus's Elements of Theology which reads, that which partakes in the one is both one <coughs> and not one. Godfrey insists that this kind of act potency composition is not purely imaginary or not merely fictitious. Godfrey was quite familiar with Henry's theory of intentional distinction, of course, and he rejects it, including Henry's notion of essay essentiae as resulting from God's exemplar causality of it from all eternity. In fact, in an interesting counter-argument against Henry, <coughs> Henry uh, he argues that Henry's theory results in assigning uh, eternal existence to um, S.A. Essentiae. And Henry was the one who had denied that human reason, pardon me, who had affirmed that human reason can prove that the world began to be. So I'm sure uh, Godfrey took great delight in making that particular point. But uh, it also goes back then to Henry's view as we, of essay essentiae as distinguished from uh, nature as realized in the mind as universal or in an, uh, in an individual as singular, uh, Henry adopts a notion taken from Avicenna, and so it's that uh, behind his, the essence considered simply absolutely, as he puts it, absolute in itself. And then finally, of course, Godfrey rejects uh, the notion of an intentional distinction, saying that makes no sense. And finally, with this then, though also we come to the end of my paper, and to Duns Scotus. And ultimately, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into him in detail, but he is a Franciscan, and he's obviously worthy of much consideration. But we have a specialist on Scotus here in the audience. What I found, though, is it's quite clear from the few references I find in his texts about a distinction between essence and existence, and he very rarely speaks of that, but he rejects it out of hand, out of any theory of their being really distinct. And when it comes to his view on the positive side of their relationship, Scotus scholars in the past have been divided. A number of them think that he defended a special kind of intermediate distinction known as the formal distinction. Others seem to prefer to, to see it as a reference to a distinction between them as, or the, as a modal distinction. 
the kind that would obtain between a given essence and its intrinsic mode. Well, the formal distinction would be a distinction between two formalities, if I understand it correctly. The, the um, modal distinction would rather be a distinction between an essence, for instance, and the mode in which, which is realized in it, such as the distinction between the divine essence and the mode of infinity in the case of God. But I would not attempt to solve that scotistic dispute as to the kind of distinction <coughs> that Scotus did defend. I'll leave that to my colleague if he wants to address himself to that either now or later because uh, uh, I'm not a scotistic scholar. He is. Thank you. Thank you, Monsignor, very much for that uh, talk. It was really wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask uh, something that, I, that occurred to me when you were talking about Godfrey. And you mentioned the parallel that he draws between um, ends and essentia and essay and uh, currens and cursus. And should be corre rei. And corre rei. Yeah, the verb. Right. Yes. Uh, but it made me think of Thomas's commentary on the text from the De Optimatibus. Uh, where uh, you get the parallel between corre and essay, and the parallel between corins and ends. And Thomas does use the term uh, cursus at one point, but he doesn't, he doesn't give a parallel term. Uh, so I was just wondering if you would comment on um, how you think the term uh, essentia in Thomas how would it relate to those other terms, uh, just on that grammatical or logical level that's you know that's at issue there? Uh, because you know Boethius's text just talks about it quote est and an essay, and you know the term essentia doesn't appear, um, and it seems like Godfrey Godfrey is committing himself to you know where to place the term essentia in that sort of grammatical and logical framework. Um, and it's always struck me as something that St. Thomas just kind of seems to, to leave aside in the commentary. So I'm wondering what, what you think about, um, about where he would place the term essentia uh, in terms of modes of signification or in terms of the, the discussion in the, the day of the Marcus. By he, you mean Thomas, or do you mean Godfrey? I, I mean uh, St. Thomas. Okay. Um, well, I don't think he lines it up that way. I haven't found him doing that, so I... I I'd rather not venture in that. I think that there was a greater emphasis, I think, uh, in the latter part of the 13th century on this, this type of distinction, or, well, the importance of distinguishing uh, at the, the appropriate mode of significandi, and uh, that Godfrey himself is aware of that. And, uh, also that uh, <clears throat> Godfrey does need some kind of uh, explanation that will safeguard divine simplicity. So I think he's reaching a little bit uh, in, in terms of his own argument, argumentation there. Uh, I, I might add, and this isn't answering your question, it rather has to do with Godfrey, but I did find quite a number of years ago uh, that there was a manuscript in Godfrey's library. By the way, he left 38 manuscripts to the Sorbonne. Well, 38 survive. He probably left even more, but at least 38 are there. And uh, <clears throat> there is uh, one of these in his library actually has a, an anonymous text. And in that text, uh, there is the very language that Godfrey used to describe this notion of something being actual insofar as it's more perfect than lower beings and being potential in terms of higher beings. And Godfrey, I'm sure, uh, took his theory from that uh, unknown author, but it must have been a master in the arts faculty because I did once transcribe that, tre little, uh, that treatise and uh, <clears throat> Godfrey would not have been the author, couldn't have been the author of it, because uh, it defends at least one or two heretical positions, and Godfrey wasn't a heretic, so uh, 
but uh, I'm sorry as far as uh, Thomas is concerned. Uh, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that helps or not because you're just asking. I don't, Thomas wouldn't have justified the real distinction simply on the basis of that he might have regarded it as grammatical distinction. Well, I guess maybe if I could just follow up. Uh, um, I mean, the question is occurred. Do you have a. Oh. Yeah, just that um, sometimes Thomas will talk about essentia as, uh, you know, an abstract counterpart for the term ends. So there are texts where he, he calls it the abstract counterpart. Um, but I was just wondering, uh, would you, I mean, so, you know, the terms corins, corsus, corre, uh, do you think that Thomas would think of essentia as, Parallel to uh, courses, to a run. Um, I just, I to a race, if you want. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think he would have denied it. it is the question is that a forcible argument? And uh, he didn't use that when it came to defending the essence existence distinction. When you were describing the, um, the thinkers that you enumerated after Aquinas, so Henry. Uh, Giles, Godfrey, and then John Duns Scotus, you seem to be suggesting that none of them, or at least it wasn't clear uh, in my listening to you, to what degree you would judge that any of them are really engaging what Aquinas himself thought, understanding it and engaging it. Could you just comment on that? To what degree do you think the, those in the, the generations after Aquinas really got what he was saying about the real distinction? Well, I'm afraid quite a few of them did not, in fact. <laughs> I think I'd have to say that. Uh, one I didn't, I, uh, I just mentioned in passing, another Dominican was named Hervéus Natalis, and he's well known for having been a champion of Aquinas' cause and of his philosophy, and especially promoting his canonization. But Hervéus rejected the real distinction between essence and existence. Now, uh, it's been a while since I've worked on him, but uh, um, there was a close association, apparently, between Hervéus and Godfrey. In fact, uh, one of the quadrivates assigned to supposedly Hervéus is simply the short version of two of the Godfrey's quadrivates pieced together and attributed to him. So it's interesting that not even all the Dominicans, including Herbeus. It's very hard for us to believe. <laughs> 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 so fundamental. Let us give our thanks to Dr.